Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. My name is Shali Prasad. I'm the Executive Director at the Center for Global Health and Social Responsibility here at the University of Minnesota. Thank you so much for joining us for our seventh annual Quee and Peterson Lecture. Our topic tonight is Compassion in Global Health, Improving Health Outcomes Through Primary Care. We have two amazing speakers that I'll introduce shortly. But first, I want to honor two people who've been integral to our center and the University of Minnesota. And I know they're watching. There's a watch party going on on campus right now. Our lecture tonight honors Dr. Paul Quee and Dr. Phil Peterson, the original founders of our Center for Global Health and Social Responsibility. Dr. Quee and Peterson have made amazing contribution to the University of Minnesota and its students and faculty. Without their support, we would not be here tonight. Between them, they put more than 120 years of service for the University of Minnesota. That in itself is amazing. Besides that, the, the support they give to any one of their contacts, any one of their students, any one of their mentees has continued and will continue to help us as we go along. Dr. Quee and Dr. Peterson, on behalf of our center and the university, and all the people that you have influenced, thank you. Thank you for your tremendous support. The Quee and Peterson Lecture has been an opportunity for us to showcase the work of brilliant global health practitioners speaking about timely issues in a very diverse range of fields. We've had an amazing group of speakers at our past events, and this year is no different. Before we begin with the webinar, I want to remind you that this is being recorded and will be available after the event, after a couple of days. I would also encourage you all to post questions in the Q&A section of the Zoom, and I'll keep an eye on those questions and post them to our speakers. This year's theme is Compassion in Global Health. One of the critical conversations occurring in global health is the provision of universal health care. This inherently brings up the need for emphasizing primary health care as a bedrock on which universal health care is built. As the conversation surrounding universal health care grows, it's important not to forget the need for compassion in the care delivery. I'm thrilled to introduce our speakers tonight who are both experts on this topic and accomplished practitioners in the field of global health. I also know their passion regarding compassion. Tonight, we are joined by Dr. Shams Saeed and Dr. David Addis. Next slide, please. Dr. Saeed is a head of policy and partnerships for the WHO Special Program on Primary Healthcare at the WHO headquarters, where he oversees a body of work to promote primary healthcare renewal through partnerships with stakeholders at global, regional, and country levels. Until October of 2022, Dr. Saeed was the unit head quality of care, where he oversaw a body of WHO work on quality of care over a seven year period. In the last five years, he has led innovative exploration of the role of compassion in quality of care and global health. His 15 year WHO career has provided an opportunity to work directly with over 30 countries. Dr. Saeed is a primary care physician specialized in public health and preventive medicine. Welcome, Dr. Saeed. Our next other speaker is Dr. David Addis, is the director of the Focus Area for Compassion and Ethics, also known as FACE, at the Task Force for Global Health in Atlanta, Georgia. After working as a general medical practitioner in migrant health, Dr. Addis spent 20 years as a medical epidemiologist at the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, where he focused on the control and prevention of neglected tropical diseases. He spent four years as a senior program officer at the Fetzer Institute in Michigan before joining the task force, where he directed the Children Without Worms program and was senior advisor to the Global Partnership for Zero Leprosy. He established FACE, the focal a focus area for compassion and ethics at the Task Force for Global Health in 2018. Again, Dr. Saeed and Dr. Addis, we are thrilled to have you tonight. And with that, I'm going to hand over the floor to Dr. Saeed. Over to you, Shams. 
Thank you so much, uh, Shaili, and um, thank you for that exceptionally warm welcome and allow me to join you in um, marking um, this moment with Dr. Key and Dr. Peterson. It's a real privilege to have this moment with you all to share some thoughts um, on the topic at hand. If I may, can I just um, just check whether you can see the slides on the screen? Yes, we can. Super. Colleagues, this is a moment where we can share a, hopefully a few thoughts on compassion in global health. It's a moment that is difficult in the face of everything that we face on the planet. But yet we have to continue and discuss and act on the issues that are at hand. Today, um, we recognize that women on our planet, our sisters, our mothers, our daughters face this adult lifetime risk of maternal death. And that's my, the point of departure that I'd like to start with today. In a country like Chad, the probability that a 15 year old girl will eventually die from a maternal cause is one in 15. In a country like Japan, that number is one in 22,000. In the country of my birth, that number is one in 390. The question that I would like to pose to you all today, is that acceptable as a planet that we're living on? With a global average of one in 210, a girl in Chad, again, one in 15, Japan, one in 22,000. And of course, as you can see, the USA won in 2,700. With that in mind, we recognize that as Shiley very clearly stated in his introductory remarks, primary healthcare is one of the most important concepts in public health. And it is indeed the most inclusive, effective and efficient path to universal health coverage. Very recently, just a couple of weeks ago in Astana, our Director General, Dr. Tedros, left us with three priorities at the end of his initial remarks to the gathering. One was to invest in primary health care with political decision making at, at required courage and being bold. Second, to focus in on operationalization of primary health care. But third, to never forget the human side of primary health care. The fact that it's not just about meeting targets, it's also about compassion. The people and communities we serve have to be at the center of all of our efforts, in his words. Recognizing this call previously, and this has been a privilege to work hand in hand with my dear colleague, David Addis and the colleagues at, the, at FACE, we have explored the linkages between compassion and healthcare. And we've utilized what we've termed a compassion equation to explore this. And what do we mean by compassion? An awareness, a cogn cognitive awareness of suffering, an empathy, an emotional resonance with the suffering person, an action, a commitment to alleviate suffering. Awareness and empathy is not enough. It's the third component, action, that really tells us where a compassion um, approach is being applied. And in that three-year exploration, we've thought about the point of care, the worker-to-worker -worker interaction, the organization of health facilities, districts, the nation, and globally. And we have pointed out and at least explored the fact that this is critical at all of these levels. The Global Health Compassion Rounds have explored various aspects of this, the linkages 
with quality of care. Quality of care, effectiveness, safety, people-centeredness, all of that is influenced by the compassion that exists within that point of care, as well as the system within which that care is provided. We've explored issues such as faith in cultivating compassion in global health, sometimes an area where colleagues shy away from, but we face that and we recognize that there is a critical linkage between faith and how compassion is cultivated, both in clinical care and in global health. The role of compassionate leadership and that requirement for that leadership to take place at the facility level, at the national level, but of course at the global level as well. And also explored in other types of issues, such as water, sanitation and hygiene, and how compassion can drive change in the, in the um, effective water, sanitation and hygiene for populations across the world. And of course, in the context that we have faced as a planet, the linkages with COVID-19 and how compassion played a role in tackling COVID-19 at multiple levels. All of that left us with a question about primary healthcare and how primary healthcare can, you, can be enhanced through compassion. But let's first ask ourselves what primary healthcare is. Primary healthcare is a whole of society approach to health aims to maximize the level and equitable distribution of health and well-being by focusing in on people's needs as early as possible uh, along the continuum of care and as close as feasible to people's everyday environment. It should be remembered that there are three components of the primary healthcare approach, starting with services, but not solely on clinical services and public health functions. While the first component is services, the second and third component focuses in on empowered people and communities and multi-sectoral policy and action. So the primary healthcare approach takes into consideration services, integrated health services, but also tackles criticality of empowerment of people and communities and the multi-sectorality that is critical for tackling the wider determinants of health. But those concepts come to life through the use of a operationalization and coming back to that emphasis that Dr. Tedros was making on the operationalization of primary healthcare through the use of the WHO UNICEF operational framework. Now, it's not about frameworks, but this is a, a mechanism to organize one's thinking in the action that can be taken by any country on our planet. And I'd like to draw your attention to the central part of this slide, which articulates those PHC levers strategic levers and operational levers. Those strategic levers focus in on the political aspects, the governance aspects, the finance aspects, and the engagement aspects. And the operational levers focus in on issues related to health and care workforce, physical infrastructure, quality of care issues, to name a few. The linkages with compassion are actually quite evident, and we'll be exploring this further in the time that we have with you. The linkages with PHC, again, coming back to this awareness, empathy, and action are clear. If one can imagine, and looking back at each of those levers of action, compassion can have an effect on each of those levers. We've explored the linkages with systems for improving quality of care, but the linkages with primary healthcare for the 
political aspects, the finance aspects, the governance aspects, and the engagement aspects are also critical for us to consider. So let's think about compassion as an engine for primary healthcare. Those three PHC components each have linkages, which we can have explored and can continue to explore. Each of those four PHC strategic levers, the politics, the governance, the financing and engagement have connectivities with compassion. And each of those 10 operational levers have connectivities. To use an example, systems for improving care. When one looks at clinical effectiveness as one key domain of quality of care, compassion is known to have a positive effect on the clinical effectiveness of care. When it comes to patient safety, another very important foundational element of quality of care, safety of care is enhanced by using a compassionate approach at the point of care. And of course, people-centeredness, the three of the, of the, of the domains of quality of care is intimately linked. But other domains such as timeliness, equity, integration and efficiency all have connections with compassion and that equation of awareness, empathy and action. And all of this is based on fundamental PHC values. And this has been with us for decades. Just to emphasize, primary health care is not a new concept. It goes back, of course, all the way to Almata, to Astana, and then onwards into our journey um, into the Sustainable Development Goals and onwards. Dr. Kui and Dr. Peterson will probably remember the discussions and the deliberations around primary health care over the decades, but it is always emphasized the solidarity aspect, the social justice aspect, and the people-centeredness aspect, while emphasizing health for all, community orientation, and equity. And that comes back to the initial reflection on the 15-year-old girl in any of these countries that we were examining. A few final points. Making PHC happen requires an engine for change, compassion the deepest human attribute that enhances solidarity and it's critical for just and lasting change. Highlighting the role of compassion and bringing it to the conscious level in all PHC action can and should be central to future-focused primary healthcare. And we may pose it that compassion provides the glue that binds the necessary action together to drive PHC at all levels of the health system, from the local most level to the national level. Wanted to thank you for this opportunity to share some of those thoughts, particularly looking forward to being able to have a dialogue with you once we have heard from my dear friend, David Addis. Thank you, Shams. That was wonderful, as always. Um, before I hand this over to Dr. Addis, if you folks have any question, folks in the audience have any question, feel free to enter that in our Q&A section, and I will, as a moderator, bring it up to our speakers. Over to you, David. Thank you very much, Shaili. It's a joy and such a pleasure to be with you today. And I feel very honored to participate in the Quee and Peterson lecture with my dear friend, Shams Said. So Shams has highlighted how the PHC framework is grounded in and is a manifestation of compassion. And he's also described the values that support the compassionate work of primary health care. 
In the next few minutes, I'd like to complement Shams's observations and explore, in addition to compassion, how primary health care promotes social justice and human flourishing. But I'd like to begin with the question, why do we seek health care? I invite you to reflect on a specific time in your own life when you are in need of health care, perhaps an emergency situation or um, an event that prompted you to need health care, maybe urgently or maybe over time. What were your concerns? What were your fears, your hopes? What loss had you experienced? And what further losses were you maybe anticipating? What was it that you needed at that moment? Now, Shams has described compassion as a virtuous response to suffering, response that involves awareness of suffering, an empathic resonance, and then action to alleviate the suffering. I'd like to explore this fundamental issue of suffering a little bit more. Sometimes the suffering that compels us to seek health care is related to physical pain, injury, or physiologic dysfunction. A parable from the Buddhist tradition speaks of this as the first arrow of suffering. But this first arrow is often accompanied by a second arrow, the meaning of that pain, injury, or dysfunction, the loss, the potential loss that it represents, the fear and the vulnerability that we feel and that is provoked by this injury or event. Eric Castle has written that suffering is distinct from physical symptoms, even though they may be at its source. The goal of treatment, Castle says, is to maintain the intactness and integrity of the person. So this second arrow, the threat to the integrity of the person, is often a greater concern to us, the patient, than the first arrow, especially with chronic stigmatizing or debilitating diseases. So in general, I would say that when we seek health care, we're often in a state of vulnerability. Yes, we seek technical competence, but we also need compassion. And if you'll bear with me for a moment, I will share my screen. And can you see that? Hope you hope that you can. So evidence is rapidly accumulating on the crucial role of compassion in healthcare. And in their recent book, which I recommend to you if you haven't read it, Compassionomics, Stephen Treziak and Anthony Mazzarelli summarized the well-documented benefits of compassion. As Shams had mentioned, compassion improves the physical and mental health of patients, as well as their adherence to, to treatment. It improves the well-being of healthcare providers. And it even makes economic sense for healthcare organizations and systems. The, the data are increasingly convincing along these lines. So medical care that only addresses the first arrow in a transactional mechanical way and doesn't attend to the intactness and integrity of the person is an ineffective and inadequate response to human suffering. The scholar John A. Powell has distinguished two forms of suffering, which have important implications for primary health care, I think. On the one hand, there is ontological or existential suffering, the inevitable suffering associated with being human, the suffering of old age, infirmity, death, and loss. On the other hand, there's social suffering, suffering that's not inherent in our being but arises purely from our social arrangements. Powell calls this surplus suffering because it's unnecessary. The suffering of racism, poverty, lack of education, discrimination, stigma, loneliness, and isolation. Surplus suffering has a powerful effect on the physical and emotional health of people. 
And in public health, we refer to social suffering as the social determinants of health. So I would argue that, so, that suffering is a central concern of health care, particularly primary health care and of global health in general. Powell observes that suffering is also a central concern of social justice. And the compassionate response to social suffering is the pursuit of justice. To explore what these two forms of suffering might mean for primary health care, let's return to these six cardinal virtues of PHC, which Shams showed you earlier. The value of people-centeredness speaks to the need for compassionate clinical care, the health services, for addressing the needs that patients bring to their encounter in the health system, the first and the second arrows. It also speaks to the relational heart of primary health care. The remaining five values inform PHC's response to social suffering, the values of health for all, solidarity, community orientation, social justice, and equity. So primary health care addresses both forms of suffering. It's committed to providing compassionate quality care to individuals and to addressing the systemic causes of social suffering. Now, Shams also described the three components of PHC, but I'd like to focus on the center. At the center is well-being or human flourishing. And this goal of well-being is embedded in the WHO definition of health, the WHO Global Action Plan, and the Sustainable Development Goals. It's, it's central. The importance of compassion for flourishing is particularly critical in the moment that brings us to healthcare, where we're vulnerable and we're experiencing suffering that drives us to seek healthcare. I'd like to summarize these comments with a visual representation. As humans, we experience both ontological suffering and social suffering that results from our social arrangements. Both of these interact with each other and they lead to disease and they threaten the integrity of the self. And this prompts us to seek primary health care. Now, compassionate, Quality primary health care alleviates ontological suffering grounded in the values of people-centeredness and community orientation. Compassionate primary health care also challenges the arrangements that lead to social suffering through its commitment to values of health for all, social justice and equity, and through its insistence on multi-sectoral action leading to empowered communities. And by attending to both ontological and social suffering, compassionate PHC also promotes human flourishing. So a key question for us is how do we actually bring compassion more fully into our day-to-day -day work of global health and of primary health care specifically? I'd like to offer a few preliminary thoughts and I look forward to our discussion. First, compassionate primary health care already exists in many places, including the University of Minnesota. There are thousands of exemplars of compassion in our midst. We need to pay attention to them and learn from them. Secondly, at the individual level, we have randomized controlled trials that document the effectiveness of compassion training. If we seek to become more compassionate, to respond to suffering more compassionately, we can do so. We have clinical evidence that this training has an effect. Compassion is a skill that can be learned. But unfortunately, this kind of training is a rarity in schools of health sciences, and I think particularly in schools of medicine. In addition to training, compassion is a daily minute by minute practice requiring commitment to being present to others and in relationship with them. And our capacity for this may vary uh, minute by minute throughout the day. There are several tools that have been developed to help strengthen our capacity 
for compassionate responses to suffering in clinical settings. And I'd like to highlight one example that I just learned about last week. The Spiritual Health Department at Emory University Healthcare in Atlanta views patient encounters as a four-stage process. And this is taught to the chaplains and to other healthcare providers. First, before seeing a patient, mentally and emotionally prepare to meet the patient. Take a moment to breathe, to be grounded. Second, intentionally attuned to the relationship with the patient. Primary health care is relational at its core. And then third, try to access compassion, this desire to alleviate suffering, or at least contributing to the alleviation of that suffering. And then finally, entrusting the patient and being able to end that encounter and move on to the next patient. This approach, and there are several others that are similar, are very relevant for all of us in global health and all primary health care providers. But individual efforts, not enough. Compassion has to be supported and nurtured by the healthcare organizations and systems. And here, as Shams already mentioned, leadership is crucial. I'm happy to say that under Shams's leadership, the World Health Organization is developing an online course for primary health care leaders, which will include a module on compassionate leadership. I find it interesting that schools of business, more than schools of health sciences, are now offering training and conducting research on compassionate leadership. Organizations can also establish expectations, group processes, and policies that promote the intentional practice of compassion, not only for patients, but for colleagues and staff. Now it's clear, especially uh, in these times that our health systems do not yet fully embody the values of primary health care and systemic change will not come easily or quickly. We need to work strategically with our partners in other sectors, particularly in finance, policy, even politics, to align our organizations with our core values. This is a long-term effort. It requires fortitude, patience, and shared learning across different systems and from one country to another. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and for the opportunity to share these thoughts. And I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you, David, that was wonderful. Um, we'll jump over to the questions right away. There's been a few coming in. Uh, the first one is from Petra Hedkamp from uh, uh, McGill University. I think this is for you, Shams. I'd be interested to hear more on the operational levers and maybe some concrete examples of compassion and equitable partnership to implement PHC. Yeah, thank you, um, Shaili, and, and thanks for that question uh, to Petra. Um, if we look at each of those levers, just to re-emphasize that they're interdependent. So we can't talk about issues of, say, for example, systems for improving quality of care without talking about physical infrastructure issues or issues related to financing. Um, so that's one important point of emphasis. Um, and turning to the expansion of the point from the global health compassion rounds on quality of care, it's very clear um, from experience in the United States that um, David alluded to in, in the work of Tr Stephen Trishiak, but also from experiences across the world that when compassion is placed within the health facility, the organization of services, as well as that individual point of care, that there are results associated with it. So it's not a nice to have, it's something that enhances and provides a cutting edge to the quality of care that's delivered to patients. And perhaps also to emphasize that while that clinical care is important, compassion allows 
that consideration of the family, the community within which with that patient resides. And of course, that's the core principle of primary healthcare, an integration of that clinical care with the wider um, family and community dynamics. So those examples exist, as David was highlighting, they are pockets in various places. The Global Health Compassion Rounds have actually brought a lot of that wisdom and, and documented it. Um, and we can definitely place um, a reference to that in the chat so that colleagues can go really into the, into the weeds on many of those specific experiences. I definitely urge Petra to take a look at the report out of the Global Health Compassion Rounds on that um, uh, Stephen Trishiak was a, was a guest at. Thanks, Shane. Thank you, Shams. Wonderful. Uh, there's a series of questions from Haley Fry, from Adi Viravan, from who's at Bali right now, and a few others who have asked a question. What are the key components of compassion training in medical schools? And should, this is from Haley, should you, uh, do you believe that compassion and cultural humility can be effectively incorporated into medical student training? And David, I'm going to get you started on that. Thank you, Shaili. I think um, our experience having gone through medical school and um, participating in medical school education would lead us to be cynical, perhaps. Um, but I think underneath most the under, underneath um, a lot of the competitiveness and um, maybe hubris that comes along with becoming a doctor, um, there's also a desire to be of service and a desire to alleviate suffering. And um, if you go back in history, particularly, you know, Osler and others, that this compassion being a core value, not only of global health, but of, of medicine, I think it's it's there. It's It's still there, even though it's covered up. And I think part of the challenge of how it's why it's hard to see is because our systems, and there's well well documented studies of this kind of beat empathy out of us in the process. And so one of the things we need to do is re-examine the, the training process, what are what's required, make it more human and human-centered. But I do believe, and there's some evidence from Emory University where cognitively based compassion training is, is um, being planned for all medical students. Many of them have uh, participated in this and we're trying to expand it to public health students. The basic elements of that compassion training is our self awareness, connecting with this innate desire that we are all connected, that my well being is intimately linked to your well being, and that we share common purpose and common ground. I think for particularly for us in, in healthcare, we also, part of the compassion training is, a, is awareness that we also suffer, that we're not just healers, but we're human beings. And we have to acknowledge our own suffering, which paradoxically helps us be in solidarity with others who are suffering. And so there's there's a humanization of the doctor, as well as sort of the training of the skills of self-awareness, of mindfulness, and of being able to offer uh, compassion. So there are skills based, but there's also an interior journey that I think is required. And I think the preliminary evidence is that when offered this in a supportive setting, healthcare providers, medical students, nursing students are, are hungry for this type of training. So I'm optimistic that if we offer it, it can have an effect in our uh, medical school and other healthcare services training. Thank you, David. Here's a follow-up from Dr. Phil Peterson. Uh, thank you for this outstanding talk. What is the relationship of compassion to the art of medicine? Mm. And does technological development promote or prevent Compassion is a fundamental component of care. What about AI? So Shams, I'm going to get you to take a crack at that first. Great question. Thank you, Shaili. And thanks for the question. Um, 
art of medicine, technology, both. Um, now, in terms of art of medicine, maybe linking it to the previous question, let's think about in many parts of the world, not all parts of the world, but many parts of the world in, in applications to medical school or applications to nursing school or any other allied health profession, professions, there's a personal statement that's written. What does what are those personal statements often refer to? It often yeah. refers to the art of medicine. It often refers to the heart of medicine. Um, and, and of course, has to also include various other aspects of, um, of, um, of, of excellence that requires attention. But it's often that art of medicine that is forgotten over the period of time that elapses between the initial um, training and then, of course, postgraduate training. So it's almost, and again, we, we can be a little controversial in the safety of this space, it's often beaten out of of, of health professionals. Um, and that is something that we need to be able to challenge. And that needs to be challenged through compassionate leadership um, within uh, training institutions. It's interesting to, uh, to reflect on the recent Astana dialogue. Um, one of the things that was being considered is the role of technology in the future of primary healthcare. At the same time, placing compassion within the equation. And it's interesting that the youth-led outcome statement of, for the primary healthcare um, reconvening in Astana just a few weeks ago, the issues of compassion were placed quite centrally, but the importance of medical technology, which is appropriately used, strategically developed, including AI, but with, a, with clear parameters. So it's not technology for technology's sake, but technology to enhance the care that's delivered to people, and also technology that takes into account the human elements of primary healthcare. Charlie. Thank you, Shams. David, anything to add to that? No, I, I think that um, technology, at least in the last couple of decades in the United States, has been used primarily to become more efficient and maybe to save costs. I think technology can equally well serve the purpose of compassion and of alleviating suffering. We haven't thought of technology in the same way. And I think there's a lot of potential there. But if we're if compassion is a living value for us, we will we will seek ways to incorporate technology in ways that enhance that relationality and the delivery of compassion as well as care. Thank you, David. Here are a couple of questions that are related, one from Dr. Walker. As human beings were thoughtful and introspective, many of us are driven by core values. However, we don't seem to bring that up. Uh, we have not elevated the discussion of suffering and compassion. Why do we as clinicians or healthcare providers not talk about this being central to our work? And from Elizabeth Abraham, Shams Said mentioned that mentioned that there was a strong correlation between compassion and faith, but that people have been shying away from that topic. What do you think is causing this shyness? So two part. One, why aren't we elevating this in our everyday work? And why aren't we bringing the aspect of faith in this? Shams? Sure, sure. Great, great questions absolutely fascinating um why are we not elevating the subject um I, I i would highlight that actually many frontline practitioners are actually elevating this subject so yes it may need further attention it may need amplification but having had the privilege of working with frontline health workers that are emphasizing and manifesting compassion in some of the most difficult places on the planet, it's happening. And if we pay attention and if we 
focus in on these colleagues and their heroic stories, as David was highlighting exemplars, then I feel that we have an opportunity to almost have a ripple effect in different systems. So that's one part of the response. The colleague that asked the question is right in asking the question because there is, in some situations, a hesitance to bring this subject up. It can sound too idealistic, it can sound soft, but the science of compassion tells us that one, it isn't soft, it's probably one of the hardest areas to master, but it, the return on investment associated with investing in compassionate systems, not just placing the burden on that individual worker, but actually developing the culture around it and the systems around it can yield results. And the second part of this question is, why are we not thinking or elevating the role of faith? This is a sensitive area. And again, in the safety of um, this um, event, it's difficult to bring in issues of faith in the world that we live in. Um, and that's an actual manifestation of the toxicity within which we live. If we are unable to share the faith upon which our work is based, something is not quite right. That's not really telling you the solution and that's not the role um, of, this, um, of this intervention, but essentially there's something not quite right in not being able to discuss faith and its linkages with compassion. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Shams. David, anything to add to that? Yeah, I think it's a wonderful question. And I think it's one that we um, have asked ourselves. I think uh, the more removed we get from primary care, the more scientific we become. We tend to think, oh, this, as Shams mentioned, this stuff of compassion or love, it's very soft, it's emotional. We're, sm we're smarter than that, we're scientists, we deal with facts. Um, I like to tell my epidemiology colleagues that if you look at the neuroscience of compassion, that's much more rigorous methodologically than my epidemiologic methods. So there's some serious science under sort of undergirding uh, compassion. I also think there might be, we, we um, do value humility in global health. And we might be um, feeling a claim compassion, might be an act of pride. We're, we're reticent to, to claim that for ourselves or pin that label on ourselves. And so I, I think it's a complex question, but I think um, part of the global health compassion rounds has been to bring compassion into our discourse and to um, permeate it. My sense is that when you give people the space, even in scientific meetings to talk about compassion, why they're in this work. We did this at the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene a few years ago. They had to kick us out of the room after the, the, the session was over because everybody wanted to talk. Uh, and so I think there's a hunger to, to talk about this and we need to provide more space for it. Thank you, David. Your point about us being more ethos-based, forgetting the pathos part of it is I think a beautiful one. Yeah. We've gotten that over decades of drilling it into ourselves. Thank you. There's a bunch of questions, including from um, Jim Bryce, Jim Hart, um, many others here who are concerned about application of this compassion-based work in busy systems, particularly in low and middle income countries, where often uh, workers are underpaid, overworked and underappreciated and as Al Shul indicated, where you might be bombed and basic needs like food, water, and power are being denied. So in those situations, uh, Mitiku Getu and Dao Yang, Dao is a refugee who grew up in a refugee camp, is asking, how can we apply these principles back in those stressful situations, stressful circumstances? So Shams, over to you first. 
Absolutely, and it's wonderful to to hear from all of those colleagues and also bringing in the personal side of, of, of experience. Um, just to reiterate, it's simply not good enough to bring the concept of compassion into a busy health worker's life without considering those multiple layers that we outlined. So whether it's the, uh, we and as, as we have mentioned within the Global Health Compassion Rounds, the way that we examine things was related to the point of care, but immediately taking that facility organization aspect, the linkages with health workers into consideration. Um, one of the things that's most striking is that the most difficult situations produce the most compassionate responses. And it is a testimony to the health and care workers within these situations that they continue to display attributes of compassion even within the midst of absolute chaos. Um, and we had the privilege of hosting some of the colleagues that have been able to manifest that in their everyday practice across the world. Um, one of the things that I, maybe and this is a personal reflection, um, at, in, 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 in times of uh, emergencies spanning West Africa, Ebola, all the way to Afghanistan, my personal encounters with human beings at the front line tell me time and time again that in the midst of absolute chaos, compassion can change the nature of clinical care, but also the organization and planning of care. Even to this day, I still remember the gentleman in a West African country during the Ebola crisis that had lost his wife the day before and was showing up to a meeting to plan for recovery of health services within his country. That was a compassionate response. That's, those was the real compassionate response. And there's hundreds of those that you can actually go through. And I know that colleagues will have personal experiences related to that. I feel very passionately about that in that the burden shouldn't lie on the health and care worker, but the system needs a compassion injection. And that's why we also need to think about issues such as water sanitation and hygiene, which I emphasized specifically, because without that, the discussion becomes a little bit theoretical. But when you bring in issues such as physical infrastructure, pay, workload, when those um, aspects are brought into the conversation, it becomes a real conversation about how compassion and that three part of compassion equation can be applied, Shaili. Thank you, Shams. Here's a question from Antonia Wilcoxon, who's an amazing person here in Minnesota. Thank you, Antonia, for this question. Can you please comment about the practice of individualism in our culture? Is compassion able to coexist with individualism? Is there an opening to solidarity? And David, over to you. I see individualism and compassion as in tension with each other. Yeah. I think compassion arises, at least that's the teaching of many traditions, because we realize that we are interconnected deeply, that um, I am like you, you are like me. And my well-being, my health, my security is bound up with yours, this principle of Ubuntu from uh, South Africa, Southern Africa. I, I think it's a, um, it's a really, um, th these are intention. And I think the epidemic of loneliness that we find in our country now is a result of this individualism. So um, we have a cultural problem with compassion. And um, the, I do see these as, as intention uh, with each other. And, uh, and yet, um, sometimes through suffering, we realize our need for others and our interconnection. And so there's this, there's this paradox of suffering um, 
being the ground from which compassion needs to respond, but also can make us more aware of our own need for compassion uh, and for connection with others. But I, I agree with the, the questioner. Yes, these are definitely in tension with each other. Yeah. Thank you for that, David. Um, here's a question from Rahmat Bekti from Indonesia. I believe that being a compassionate person is a call of my spiritual belief. However, not many of my colleagues in Indonesia share this view because they come into PHC because they couldn't become a specialist. Mm -hmm. The work of PHC is very dense. Is there an answer to this, Shams, besides more PHC workers? <laughs> Thank you to, to the, for, for, the, uh, for the question on this one uh, from the colleague in Indonesia. Um, there's two aspects to this that she, um, he or she is um, um, coming at. It is, um, there is the specialism versus generalism aspect, and then there's this, the spiritual aspect, right? So um, first of all, just to highlight that, um, I'm going to come at, at a point of, of bias here, but being a, a primary care physician is a specialty. Mm -hmm. So you, it's one of the most difficult specialties that one could imagine. Um, but I come at it from a point of bias. Um, so that's one key message that we can perhaps emit across the world is that understanding a human being holistically and treating a human being in totality is something very special and it's incredibly complex. So that also needs to be emitted through a compassionate um, leadership angle from the those that are uh, organizing health services should also emphasize that when we talk about um, primary care, we're not saying or indicating anything related to moving away from hospitals. Hospitals are key, fundamental. If my mother needs attention, I need an integrated service that can get her to specialist care as quickly as possible. But there is a specialization in generalism that needs to determine when my mother needs to go to that tertiary care hospital. So that's the one thing that I would always highlight in terms of the generalism and specialism aspect. In terms of spirituality, um, again, speaking very openly in the uh, parameters of this, um, of this event, um, personally, I think it's critical to bring a, a spiritual dimension into and I'm not talking about religion, I'm talking about spirituality, understanding one's own human convictions on why one is involved in healthcare and in health, I think is fundamental to the advancement of human health. And that orientation of a health system towards a primary healthcare approach actually has some spiritual aspects that we could aim to explore. I'll leave it at that, Shadi. Thank you, Shams. Dr. Walker added that it's important for an Indonesian colleague to stay focused on a core value. Thank you. It's a privilege to be taking care of patients. Um, Dr. Bill Toscano has a question, David, similar to the individual question, but slightly different in the sense, is compassion compatible with the trend away from government funded versus privatization of health systems globally? Um, it, it's a really good question. Um, my sense is that when the privatization is driven by uh, primarily by a motive of profit, as we see in this country with private equity firms owning more and more hospitals, um, the the those are not compassionate values. Um, uh, and I think, Part of compassion, there's a fierce aspect of compassion, the compassion that fights for justice, fights for human rights. And I think we need to call out the um, economic forces that are turning healthcare into a business and are making it more and more difficult for the healthcare providers that are motivated by compassion to provide compassionate care. Now, that said, 
government hospitals may also have gaps in compassion. So I, I don't think it's strictly a government versus private. It's really the values of the private entity, the values of the government service, um, and are they structured in a way, are the systems structured in a way for those values to permeate into day-to-day -day This is a two-part question. One is, when do you start training in compassion? How early um, can you expect that exposing medical students to volunteering might help with this? And another question, which is an interesting one, that other professions, particularly nursing, has concentrated a lot on compassion-based training. Shouldn't we, bringing the, shouldn't we be bringing that into medical education? Shams, over to you first. Okay, great question. Um, in terms of starting point, this is where the holistic aspect of the primary healthcare approach comes in. Multi-sectorality includes education and education includes primary education. So actually way before coming into nursing school, midwifery school, one has to think about how we are bringing educational components at the earliest stages. So early development, early intervention related to compassion and understanding each other, I believe is critical. So I would even go way back beyond the, 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 the actual training associated with medical school, nursing school, et cetera, et cetera. On nursing, absolutely. I think if you think about individual experience, you recognize nurses bringing compassion into action day to day, every day. And I think that's something that we should be appre appreciating and not just appreciating, but understanding why that is. And if we understand why that is, it will take us back to the point that the questionnaire is bringing, is that there's something in the training that, he, uh, that we do need to bring in and actually inject into other forms of training for other disciplines. So there are many aspects of training that should cross over into different areas of the multidisciplinary team that is, of course, at the heart of primary care. Thank you, Shams. There's a question here from an anonymous attendee, which I'm going to treat as a rhetorical question because it's so beautiful. Shouldn't the subject of compassion be discussed with all members of the provider system, all who come in contact with the patient, the cleaning staff, the guard, the kitchen staff, billing, pharmacy, etc.? Good point. Thank you for that. Uh, David, a question for you. There is uh, Matteo Framholz, one of our PhD students, has been peeking at the books behind you. And he feels that some of the concepts that you talked about resonate with what Paul Farmer talked about, structural violence. Do you see any correlation between them? And how do you build on those ideas? Yes, I, I think um, as... John Deepa was talking about this social suffering really is about structural violence. The social suffering is optional. We, we don't have to uh, experience social suffering. It's the commitment to um, addressing that structural violence. And this is where the perhaps the, the arc of change is longer. Um, those of us who are fed by patient encounters need to become more patient and maybe more wily in dealing with systems uh, and and to understand what are the le the levers of change that we can push. It's it's a long term commitment, but but absolutely, I think um, Paul Farmer actually was motivated largely by um, his Catholic tradition and faith, uh, and uh, this is an example of the um, of one's faith being manifest in in his his work. Um, Charlie, if I could just comment on the previous. Um, question or, or rhetorical question. I had herniated disc surgery uh, a few years ago, and the one person in the entire healthcare team that I experienced compassion from was the phlebotomist that came in at two in the morning to draw my blood. Uh, she was only there for 90 seconds, maybe two minutes, but something about her demeanor, the way she interacted with, with me, communicated compassion in a way that 
was not communicated by doctors or nurses or those who were so-called professionals. So absolutely, I fully agree with that. And that's where the compassion is most often delivered and experienced, I think, is through the, the other members of the healthcare team. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, here's a question. It's um, Shams, you had indicated about the low paternal mortality rate in Japan. And the question here is, are there components of compassion that makes Japan more successful? Or is it more than that? Great question. And I would love for a PhD student to be examining that in detail. I have some thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, Post-war, when Japan um, set up its universal health coverage um, architecture, um, that was coming from a place of intense suffering. Um, and the common vision of universal health coverage was what drove the system. And of course, massive volumes have been written on the, the actual trajectory of the Japanese health system. Mm -hmm. Not from a purely compassionate lens, but from a whole of society approach, it's a textbook case of when a country focuses in on the health of its entire population and designs with intent, um, compassion for that population, in my mind, was driving that long-term investment in mm -hmm. the entire population. Now, of course, you know, speaking to Japanese colleagues, they'll tell you there are a whole range of issues that they're tackling and they'll be scratching their head and, and saying there's so many issues, we've, we've got a real crisis, et cetera, et cetera. But when you look at the actual trajectory and the nature of the system, it's seriously impressive. And why is it that that, that starting slide in terms of a 15-year-old girl, why is it that that girl has that difference with any 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 other part of the of the of the planet there is an element of compassion which is injecting in into this whole of society approach undoubtedly i would i would For just that. add Charlie, that it's also a much less individualistic society uh, than the united states and i think that going back to the earlier question i think that also plays a role here sure and this is an um this is a Almost a follow up of that, David. This is from Nana Yabanka, who's asking the question Are there differences in how compassion is practiced across cultures and across faith? And are there common threads, common theories, common understandings of suffering that could help us all understand that? It's such a great question, and it's something we're intensely interested in exploring now. Um, we often focus on the giving of compassion. We don't often focus on the receiving of compassion. Mm -hmm. And so I think there are certain ways that compassion is expressed um, and received. And certainly if those two are in harmony, then there's this, there's this resonance that uh, compassion just kind of emerges. Um, and that's part of the reason why when we train in global health, understanding the cultures that we're going to work with is so important. Yeah. But I, I think there's there's definitely some commonality. The human soul is the human soul, and the way it's expressed um, certainly varies from one place to another. Yeah. It's wonderful, wonderful. Um, Shams, one last question. I'm going to try and combine this. One of it is around the premise of um, barriers to a compassion-driven primary health care. And do you think primary health care inherently is more compassionate or is that compassion needs to be there in all areas and then compassion need can come in other areas too? And then maybe an extension of it is, are systems beating compassion out of the providers? Yeah, complex one. Um, barriers are multiple and are manifested in different contexts in different ways. Um, I would perhaps highlight an upstream barrier, which is perhaps the recognition of the importance of compassion within health systems and the, the soul of health systems almost, that recognition is perhaps the, the biggest barrier. 
But then, of course, then you have all of the different sort of um, um, subcategories of barriers. If you examine and not to just, you know, to, 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 to always go back to this framework, but if you look at each of the strategic and operational levers that focus in on primary health care, each of those levers have specific attributes and specific barriers to injecting into comp it with compassion. So the linkages can be articulated and we've summarized that linkage in a recent um, um, document that was released um, by uh, FACE uh, uh, and we can make that available. But those linkages are also a way of mapping out the potential barriers. Um, and in answer to the second part of the question, just reminding ourselves when we're talking about primary health care, we're talking about the radical reorientation of health systems towards primary health care, the approach, rather than just focusing in on primary care as a level of care. So we are looking at this in its entirety. And in order for it not be beaten out of the those that are working within that system, strong investment in health and care workforce. That's the fundamental upstream point alongside this recognition of the soul of a health system, Shaili. Thank you, Shams. Uh, we have one more question, but in the interest of time, I'm going to pose it to everybody to think about. Can compassion be observed and audited? We'd like to hear from you, so please email us your thoughts. And David, we'll have a discussion about auditing compassion. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Thank you so much, Shams and David. This has been wonderful. I thank you all, for uh, everyone, for attending this session. This was a great discussion. I also want to especially thank Dr. Paul Quee and Dr. Phil Peterson, after whom this lectureship has been named, as long-standing leaders within our global health community and as the founders of our center. They have built this platform we are using to strengthen the University of Minnesota's ties with partners around the world. Again, this lecture will be available on our website soon. You can also view our previous uh, Quee and Peterson lectures at, on our website. Before we go, I have two quick asks for you. One, we're going to drop a survey about this event in the chat right now. Please click on it. Please take time to fill this survey and share your feedback so we can improve future events. You'll also receive a copy of this survey by email too. And please consider supporting the work of our center with a gift to the QP Fund so we may continue to provide you with webinars like this one. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Looking forward to more compassion practice in our healthcare delivery practices. Bye now.